Hello everybody. Um, I see you all logging in right now. So we'll get started because we've got lots to get through today. Um, hopefully you're all logged in for the role of farmer-led groups in the delivery of environmental land management and natural capital markets. A little bit of a mouthful. Um, if not, don't worry, you're still in for a really interesting conversation, so I'd stick around anyway. Um, my name is Catherine Boyd and I lead stakeholder engagement at DEFRA for the Environmental Land Management Scheme. Um, what that means in layman's term is my job is to make sure the people that will be delivering the work, so farmers and land managers, are involved in how we're designing it and know what's going on. Um, so hopefully that's helpful. Um, and today I'll just be chairing the session. We've got some really good panellists that I'll come in to introduce later. But just before we get started, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the value of um, this conversation for the Environmental Land Management Scheme. Um, it's really important for what we're delivering in a number of ways. Firstly, um, collaboration is going to be a really key element of how we deliver the outcomes we want to. We know that there needs to be join up and we know that that's not easily achieved and the role of facilitators is really key for that. Um, secondly, about the role of support and delivery for land managers. They're really close to their land, they know it, they're in their local regions and actually building that support around them um, rather than a national kind of top down layer. And then finally, the big point about natural capital. Um, ELM is being delivered for public taxpayers um, and we're paying using taxpayer money, but we don't want to be public versus private financing. We want it to be an open market where everyone can work together. And again, facilitators could play a really important role in helping to crowd in private finance alongside what we're doing in ELM. So we've got a really good panel today and I'm gonna be giving them a good grilling, which is always the best role to be on these things. So I'm gonna let them introduce themselves because otherwise it'd be boring hearing from me. So should we start with Mike? Would you like to introduce yourself to everybody? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mike Edwards. I'm the uh, Managing Director for Norfolk FRAG, so the Norfolk Farming and Wildlife Advice Group. Uh, we've got about 300 members in Norfolk, which we advise on uh, conservation and agro-environment projects. Um, we've also got quite a bit of experience uh, working with uh, facilitation funding. We uh, originally helped set up the, uh, the Wenson Group, and we uh, also run and facilitate groups on both the River Wissey and the River Glaven in Norfolk. We um, also, as FWAG, we, we quite frequently bring groups of landowners together for kind of knowledge exchange, uh, trying to sort of share that knowledge on best environmental practice. Uh, I've also recently been working on a DEFRA funded test and trial in the Broads National Park, looking at collaboration uh, and different ways that landowners can collaborate and thinking about how Elms might be able to support that collaboration. And just one other thing I've been working on as well is um, uh, one of the Natural England um, Biodiversity Net Game pilots as well. And uh, with, a, again, a, a, a group of six landowners there coming together to explore Biodiversity Net Game, but also other natural capital opportunities that may arise. So not much, Mike. Um, just just a few things. Um, Ian, should we come to you next? Would you introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ian Gould from Oak Bank Game Conservation. Uh, we're based in Huntington in Cambridgeshire, but we work uh, nationwide. Uh, we run a number of uh, officials, facilitated group, uh, a couple of um, privately funded ones, uh, and some informal groups. Um, we're also involved with a, a live a biodiversity net game project. And, um, you know, we feel from our experience, we've seen the, the real benefits of collaboration, both sort of the obvious ones and the less obvious ones um, and things like, you know, just social support and, you know, the, the social side of being a member of the group and feeling more supported locally. So we're, we're very positive that it's, it's very much something that we should be um, pushing forward through the new Elm scheme. Brilliant. Thank you, Ian. Lizzie, you're next on my screen. Hi everyone. Yeah, so I'm Lizzie Emmett. So I'm a farm advisor for the Wenson Farmers Group. If you've never heard of us, do check out our website. So I run the Wenson Farmers Group, 27 farmers, 10,000 hectares in the beautiful River Wenson. So we are totally self-funded and the farmers uniquely fund my role, which is quite special. Um, and we work towards water quality and biodiversity. And very excitingly, we've been involved with a few testing trials for the new Elm scheme. Great. Uh, Ellen, you're next on my screen. Thanks, Catherine. Hi, everyone. I'm Ellen Brown. I'm the head of policy for the Local Nature Recovery Scheme, which is 
one of the future schemes that will reward land managers for delivering environmental benefits alongside the sustainable farming incentive and um, landscape recovery. Uh, some of my cross-cutting responsibility is around um, spatial prioritization, so how we make sure we're delivering the right outcomes in the right places, um, making sure that dovetails with what people in um, local communities um, want to see. Um, and also around collaboration, which is my um, chief interest in this session today. So I'm really interested in how we can make sure that um, we're supporting collaboration in future schemes and uh, really looking forward to hearing from our panelists this afternoon. Thanks, Ellen. And last but not least, AJ. Oh, you're on mute. Classic, a year later, we still can't do it. Still learning. Um, hi, everybody, I'm AJ Paul. I'm a, a mixed farmer, farm manager from East Suffolk. Uh, on uh, an area known as the Sandlands, growing potatoes, onions, carrots, livestock, cereals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, back in 2015, I um, stupidly signed myself up to be a Natural England facilitator, uh, and have ended up with three groups in East Suffolk, um, totaling about 60 holdings and covering about 60,000 acres. Um, it's been a fascinating journey. And uh, the first group uh, technically came to an end in September last year, uh, but all three groups have asked myself and my um, uh, co-facilitator, um, a lady called Diane Ling from Suffolk Flag, to continue uh, with the group uh, or the groups moving forward. So that's what we intend to do. Always good to be demanded and definitely want to come back to you about the reality of being a farmer and a facilitator at the same mm -hmm. time. Um, doesn't seem easy. So just before I get into the questions, I just want to remind everybody, um, we will be taking questions from you. There should be a little Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or somewhere on your Zoom. Um, and you can also vote on other people's questions. So if you like a question, vote on it, and I'll try to prioritise the questions from you that are at the top. But we'll get cracking straight into it. And I'm going to start with a bit of a question just to lay the land. And I'll, I'll come to you first, Lizzie. Um, what are some of the challenges faced by land managers that good facilitation can help overcome? So I think there's a whole host of different challenges. Um, I've sort of split my three key benefits into three points here. So I think having a pinnacle person to work on fundamental issues in the local area for those farmers, um, and then having uh, that pinnacle person to build relationships with outside organizations. You know, it's quite a crowded landscape sometimes, and particularly when we're in a river catchment, there's all sorts of organizations and having that pinnacle person to draw together everything Number two, proven results, absolute proven results, water quality, biodiversity, enhancement, connectivity, you have it all, as well as a community. And then thirdly, it is an absolute essential source of farm business support. So whether that's private sector or public sector money. Brilliant, Lizzie. Mike, I know that we've talked a little bit in the past about its role as for a collaboration tool and knowledge exchange. Could you go into that a little bit more? Yeah, I, it's something I think um, it's really important to actually support people in their existing kind of agri-environment schemes in trying to make those options deliver as much as possible. So that ability to kind of demonstrate from farmer to farmer how to really deliver an option. You know, for example, in the broads, we've been looking a lot at sort of breeding waders, for example, which is quite a technical thing to, to deliver. And using that kind of collaborative approach, you can take a group of landowners out to see another landowner's farm where they're delivering that really well. So I think that's a really strong, strong area for the kind of uh, knowledge, knowledge exchange. And I was just also just reflecting on the question that Lizzie took as well. I think it's, it's a really noisy environment at the moment in, in this sector. There is so much going on. And I think a really important role for the facilitator is to try and um, just pick through some of that noise and chatter to where the real nuggets of important things are or the real opportunities are. So that kind of filtering effect, I can think, could be really powerful as well. Mm. And just on, on the back of that, Mike, I want to come back on the, the kind of collaboration point. So you've talked about collaborating for, for knowledge exchange, but one of the things that we really want to achieve through the environmental land management scheme, and I think this is what a lot of you do, is bringing people together to, to deliver those outcomes. Kind of how open are farmers and land managers to these collaborations and, and how are those relationships built? I've, I've generally found farmers really open and willing to do that. You know, that's something that, you know, certainly FWAG have been doing for many, many years is taking, getting farmers together and taking them out 
to look at these topics uh, and to, to sort of talk through the challenges of, of delivery uh, on their farms and you know what are the what are the barriers what's making it difficult and uh, you know what what really helps and what te techniques have they found so you know I, I think you know collaboration is really key to doing that and I, I'd like to see in a, in a future scheme it's supported more maybe in a more targeted and structured way I guess the, there's been there are some you know that can't pretend there aren't some issues with the current way that the facilitation uh, is funded through Natural England I think but I, I you know had some ideas in the future around you know it, almost like a you know currently we have a kind of basis point scheme whether you could have a kind of nature basis type mm -hmm. Um, regime where you know as part of your you know if we're into claims or whatever as part of your your annual return on your 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 elm scheme you you tick to say look I have gone and learned more about how to deliver this option for uh, you know breeding waders again as the example and uh, you know to really show that you're delivering. Mm. I just saw AJ nodding his head so I'm going to come to AJ and then Lizzie's put her hand up using the raise hand function well done Lizzie. AJ you were nodding along there does that seem similar to kind of your experiences? Absolutely I, I, I haven't found it I mean I guess in, in our part of the world I was quite lucky insofar as a lot of the farms were already collaborating in terms of crop marketing buying of inputs etc cetera, etc cetera. so they all get the benefit of collaboration um, and b breaking down that sort of stereotypical I'm not going to tell my neighbour what I'm going to do sort of thing. That, yeah. that wasn't difficult at all. Um, I, the reason I was nodding was picking up on the combination of Lizzie's point about a pinnacle person, someone they trust, um, but also Mike's point about, um, don't want to call it education, but about you know knowledge transfer and actually um, getting people interested in the natural world. Mm -hmm. um, the trouble I, in my experience, and I've lived through all the different countryside stewardships, environmental stewardships, et cetera, et cetera, I'm showing my age now, is that it has all been about the options and what money has been attached to those options. And I think sadly too often, that's all it's been about. Now I'm, I'm, and, and when you're dealing with, with, with farmers who know about the natural world, um, it would be so much better to actually have the ability to, and this is something we've done through facilitation, is to take them out into a field or a wood and, you know, well, I'll give you an example. We, we had a whole load of farmers involved one day crawling around on their hands and knees looking at the, uh, the difference between creeping soft grass and Yorkshire fog. Uh, and these are hard-nosed commercial farmers. And it was fascinating and it really got them into... Um, you know, this is why we're doing this. It's not for the money. It's actually for the natural environment. So, mm. and you know, I think Mike's that point on education and uh, knowledge transfer really, really important. Yeah, and I think definitely the the role of of drivers and and what and understanding those within farmers is, is definitely a theme that comes out. Lizzie, I'll I'll come back to you as you've been sat there patiently with your hand up. It's just a really quick point, sort of to follow on from a couple of thoughts. Um, I think everything is about relationships. It's the relationship with the facilitator or advisor and it's the relationships between the farmers and farmers. That's what it's all about. And let's, let's not forget that these can be actually very difficult to measure. And that's something that I'm really speaking to, for example, like Ellen about is, is how we can measure and reward these types of developments, these social capitals, um, so that it doesn't get missed. But, you know, true on the ground change, stuff happening, stuff getting going, it takes time. And we need to be able to measure it. We need to be able to reward it in the future. Yeah. Ellen, I'll just jump to you and then I'll come back to Mike about kind of from a from a government perspective, um, the value of facilitation and what it can deliver and what the kind of government's aims are and, and what the role of facilitation might be hearing what you've heard just now. Thanks, Catherine. Um, yeah, so I think it's a combination and sort of building on what um, Lizzie just said. Um, I think there's a point around recognising that these groups take time to, to set up and um, sometimes because some of the limitations with flexibility and schemes, um, certainly our evaluation of um, previous um, work under the facilitation fund, we recognise that there's a lag period um, between sort of groups forming and actually being able to undertake um, environmental action on the ground. But further to, to what Andrew was saying, you know, there is so much benefit that we can that we can see that is around those, those sort of socioeconomic benefits of bringing people together and having them learning and recognizing that actually this is about 
um, sort of everyone going on a journey. Um, and particularly, you know, having left the, the EU and some really quite fundamental changes that are going on within the agricultural sector, we see these groups as, as really important in terms of building those communities and providing that support structure um, to help um, land managers transition to that delivery of environmental public goods. Um, so really, really think that that's something that um, we should continue to build on. But yeah, appreciating Lizzie and I have had a few conversations about this, that sometimes quantifying the benefits is really challenging. Not that that means we shouldn't try, um, but we do recognise that a lot of the those benefits are intangible. Mm. Mike, you had your hand up. I didn't know if you wanted to come back in. I did, but it, it was only really on the point of, of time, I think, and, and, and building trust and relationships within a group, that that does take time. Mm. Uh, to, to get to that point where you can have those sort of more open conversations and everyone's prepared to put their sort of cards on the table about what they want to what they want to achieve and I saw there was a question in the chat around um you know decision ways to facilitate decision making with a diverse and sometimes conflicted landowner based working group and I think it's it is that you know length of time some of these groups are, that I, I'm working with and Lizzie's working with have been running for quite a long time now so people have really got to know each other and uh, that some of that social aspect of it is quite important, I think, that to to be having conversations in a more relaxed environment, doing social aspects too, to really open people up a little bit. Mm. And that actually, we've got another question in, and I'm gonna I'm gonna point it towards you, Ian. I'm gonna assume this says Emmys rather than Emmys. Um, natural England's one size fits all, but a couple of people have already mentioned that there's the, the current setup isn't perfect with the current facilitation funds from Natural England. And I know that you've said that you have um, taken a lot of your facilitation funds who are now privately funded. Um, so kind of what was the rationale behind that? What, what kind of were the things that didn't quite work with the, the current facilitation fund and why did you take it private? Um, there, are, there are a few things, but the, the paperwork that we had to do to get paid doesn't doesn't help because um, that's all it just takes a lot of time that we could be doing something more useful with um, one of the biggest things though for us is is the prevention of any one-to-one -one advice through an official facilitated group so everything has to be one to many and I described it to someone as um, like taking someone to a really nice restaurant showing them the, the menu pushing them through the door and letting them get on with it and actually they sometimes need help you know choosing the wine or you know, deciding what, what goes with what or something like that. And, and we find that it, it's it's going onto the farm and, and doing one to one because when you're when you're sort of privately with a with a landowner on the farm, you can have and, and frankly when we're a we are unashamedly a commercial organization. We're not official to them. We're not we're not the police. We're not we're not we don't worry them. We can have an open conversation about the business case for a decision about choosing an option which has a certain amount of income attached to it. Um, but you can only really have those conversations discreetly one to one. And the facilitator group doesn't allow that. So um, some of our groups are funded by charities and some of them are funded by private companies such as water companies. Um, and they've all got they've all got little nuances which are which are you know pros and cons. Um, and I wouldn't say, you know, the, the one to many thing is a bad, you know, it's not a bad opportunity, but it, it, is, it isn't the answer to all the issues. And actually, um, we find also that there's a lot of conversations around the fact that farmers know what to do. They know what they've got. They know what's best. That, that absolutely isn't the case. We get asked all the time for advice about, you know, can you come and show me what's on my land? And, and sometimes it's the really, really important best fragments of habitats that are left are really small tiny bits in the corner of a field which if you don't know what you're looking for you miss them and you wouldn't realize maybe they were important or in the context of a group it might be that your neighbor's got something really really important the other side of the hedge and something you could do on your side of the hedge would, would connect it with something else or protect it or whatever so it's it's just having that access to the ground which has been it's been more difficult in a facilitated group, to be honest, because of the, the one to many constraint. Mm. Um, and you know, we, we often find that people go ahead and employ us. And I'm, I'm sure FWAG do as well. You know, you start off in a group and, and then people ask for additional help over and above whatever's advice. And, and I'd also say in a commercial sense, 
quite bizarrely, I could give someone exactly the same advice about exactly the same subject. If I charge them for it, they follow it, they take it more seriously. If I give it to them for free, it's it's not worth anything to them. Oh. Does, does that make sense? It, yes. It, you know, and, and actually you do need people when they're making business decisions to be invested in that decision. Mm. And, and that comes, it comes financially, it comes intellectually, it comes from maybe their belief system, but they do have to be invested in it if they're going to follow through on it. And, and just to come back on you there, Ian, what I'm quite interested in here is, is you've talked about a lot of examples about you have the facilitation fund and the, and the one-to-ones. How does the one-to-one element help then build the collaboration point? Because I, I know that that's quite the, has been traditionally the role of facilitation funds is helping people collaborate. So how does that one-to-one then aid that collaboration that we're aiming um, for? You can give specific pointers to other individuals in the group. So if someone's got an opportunity and they were, it might be, I was, I always describe it as like a bus journey and people get on the bus at different points but it might be that there's someone that's two stops further down that journey that you can point them towards specifically and you go why don't you go have a word with John he's he's already done this and you can show you you know and it's actually that collaboration piece is just signposting people and, it, and, and it's what Lizzie does brilliantly in her group it's signposting people to the right help but she's right having that figurehead that you go to is is crucial because mm. as soon as you as soon as you put the obstacle in the way where you need this information but you don't get a signpost of where to get it from it's an obstacle and some people are keen enough that they'll go and look for it and some people aren't but if you if you take away the barriers to making progress you'll get change on the ground that much more often and that much more efficiently okay aj you're also looking at taking your facilitation funds and going privately so I'd be interested in your your view on this and um, particularly about that one-to-one advice versus the facilitator role and and how that's important well remember to take my muse off first <laughs> which is a which is a good start um yeah I mean I would agree with a lot of what Ian's saying actually um I can see the principle of the natural link facilitation scheme being one to many because it was all about collaboration I can also see the issues in our case, what we did is we actually created a, a slush fund uh, to pay for those things which the Natural England scheme would not pay for. Um, the one thing I would certainly agree with Ian on is, is the paperwork. Um, it was, um, you know, we're getting public money, so we should be justifying it, but it was beyond tedious. And in essence, it just sucked all the fun out of the job and all the time out of the job to the point where myself and Diane Ling were wondering, you know, can we actually go and do something useful? Um, which is why we've decided not to extend uh, our funding. I think what um, Brian McDonald and his team have done at Natural England is absolutely fantastic. And it was the best way to start the whole ball rolling, mm. uh, along with the GWCT pharma clusters. And there's been a knock on effect. So um, myself and Diane have been asked to go and talk to other independent groups about setting up um, and uh, so we've done that and two or three more groups have been set up off the back of, of our facilitation groups mm. it's quite interesting i'm sure there's somebody out there that loves doing paperwork and um, i've just yet to find them uh, in my life but yeah. i'm just i'm just drawn on your point about so some of the some of the challenges and the barriers you've talked about are kind of the paperwork and and for ian it was the inability to do the one to one um but actually the csff funding and the and the setup of natural england sparked something but it now seems that you're able to get that funding from private sources and one of the things i said at the beginning was great that saves taxpayer money and then where is the best place for um government to have a role here how can we now encourage collaboration and facilitation funds if funding may not be the right thing anymore where where would that intervention be most helpful i don't know if anyone's got a particularly strong view on that um lizzie i'll come to you politely put your hand up hi um yeah i i feel really strongly about this um and something that i've actually been talking um with tim hopkins about as well um, we've actually put in for a, a landscape recovery test and trial, um, and we basically want to incorporate more private sector money as well as public money. 
there's a few different roles I see. Um, the private sector money, I think, can do quite a lot of offsetting, you know, pond restoration. And we've been working with Norfolk Ponds Project um, with Norfolk Flag, and that's been working brilliantly at these sort of 30 year agreements for pond restoration. But I also feel like in the future of collaborative groups, there is a real potential with private sector money. So, say for example, I truly believe that farmer investment into these groups is essential. They need to be paying in to the project, whether that's 50p a hectare, a pound a hectare, five pound a hectare, it's essential. What I do think though, is that if we had match funding from private sector companies, they're buying into a project, they get a massive amount of proven results from that collaboration that then provides this bank account of money to be able to go and do what you want to do. But then you've got the match funding of both the farmer and the private sector. Wow. You fixed it for us, Lizzie. Um, Mike, did you want to come in? I think that is potentially a really good model. We haven't moved any of our groups uh, onto sort of private and landowner funding yet, but I, you know, certainly that would be a good way to go. And I, I totally agree that landowners need to have that continued buy-in to that process of collaboration and supporting that facilitator and advisor. I think that would be is a really positive move forward. Where those sources of, of, of match funding come from, and that, you know, if that if that could be government funding, but it was more flexible, I think that could be quite positive um, to it. You know, I you know, not want to go backwards on the conversation, but just echoing Ian and, and AJ's points that it's been quite hard work using the facility facilitation funding it's like facilitate trying to facilitate but with one arm tied behind your back and um, without enough without enough time and um, so I think that could be a really positive model going forward to kind of tr you know almost be blending the finance towards the facilitation as much as start starting to blend the finance together towards the actual delivery of some of our environmental benefits as well brilliant Ian you've, you've got your hand up I'll let you come in Ooh. It was just really that we, we need to be careful that we don't oversimplify the messages or the terminology, because not all private money is the same. You know, it, it, it depends exactly. You have to say what you are going to deliver for the money in, in exactly the same way as we should with, with public money. You know, um, in, and I'd also say that being a member of a group doesn't mean you're actually going to do anything. It should do, but it doesn't. You know, that's... That, that's the thing. So we, we, all this, all these payments need to be for outcomes, not not just participation or whatever. There, there should perhaps be some the public money. Some someone was asking earlier. I think it was you, Catherine, about does is there still a role for public money? And I think there is sort of seed money to get these things going. And and I saw there was a question in the chat about non-funded groups. I'm not suggesting that they're not funded. They are absolutely funded. They're just funded through different channels. And um, yeah, AJ's point about sucking the joy out of the, the, the work by having to do the paperwork was exactly the term I would use. It really, it really did. Because believe me, my team, we do not do this job to do paperwork. We, we do it to get out on the ground and, and take it off a map and deliver it on the ground. That's, that's where we get our fun. And you know, my, my colleagues like Kirsty and Sarah, they're, they're out at four o'clock in the morning doing bird surveys and things like that, and they absolutely love it. But it, mm. it's it's important we deliver these results. Um, it would be great if we could have a simple um, a simple equation to sort of say right, this much money delivers this much outcome, but it doesn't work that way. Um, and we do need to understand that there is a necessity for complexity. And I hear about elms and things and people kept using words like simple but the problem is we can simplify the benefits out of these things if we're not careful mm. you know sometimes they need to be complicated they are by their nature they're, they're difficult and and as Lizzie said earlier they're difficult to measure but but a, a real ecologist will know whether things are going the right direction and, it, and it's part of the problem with the prescriptions about stewardship options is they're so tight because people need, to, people have always felt they need to be told exactly what they were expected to do. And stewardship has always paid for activity and not for outcomes because the outcomes were too difficult to measure. But with these groups, we've got the opportunity to reward outcomes, mm. particularly, particularly if they're privately funded because the, the metrics can be designed to fit the exact um, group that you're setting up. 
They haven't got to be national. They haven't got to be fair to everybody. They haven't got to represent the whole country. They've only got to represent the group that you're talking about. And I think your, your point, Ian, there about um, the word simple, I've definitely heard some, some feedback on the word simple. And there's a difference between, and I think this is where your paperwork points in about being administratively simple versus actually rewarding the fact that this is complex and it requires skill and acknowledging that and not then trying to brush the whole thing as simple. There are elements of it that are complex. It's just not having the complexity in the bit that could be easier and get people greater access. So we've had hands shooting up, which is great. And I was gonna come and give Ellen a grilling anyway, because I felt I'd been too kind to her. So Ellen, you put your hand up. So what, what did you want to come in with before I, I hit you up? I was just trying to actually um, almost sort of bring together there what Lizzie and Ian were saying. So sorry, this is a question back, Catherine. I'm being very rude. So I was trying to work out, are, are you sort of saying that you see the role for government in almost being the, the seeding funding, but then and ensuring that whatever we I was completely appreciate the point around the paperwork, but slightly leaving that to the side, is it making sure that you then have the flexibility to take these groups where you want them it almost seems like you're almost um with some of your groups you're almost sort of graduating from csff um that probably isn't the best way of putting it but you, you once you're may, maybe the, the current model works when in in those kind of the early years in the startup phase but then actually those who are more ambitious graduate from the scheme as it were I don't know, maybe it would be interesting to get reflections of that. If that's okay, Catherine, I'm, I'm usurping oh, yeah, that's your That's fine. I'm going to let everyone else answer, then I'm going to give you another grilling. Uh, Lizzie, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come back to Ellen on that point? Um, yes, I will do. And then I've got a quick quick point to follow up on. Um, I think it depends. And I think there's going to be some groups that are more suited to um, public sector money. And I think there's going to be some groups that more suit the private sector money. And I think that some groups ours being one of the examples, don't want to be owned by anything, okay? We don't want to be owned by an organisation and we don't want to be owned by a title or anything. And that's the beauty of our group because it's pharma-led to the absolute core. And what that means is it's very fluid. So when I started, our sort of main priorities were biodiversity, but within pretty much six months time, we were to steer it right round to water quality and then started doing huge water quality on the whole of the catchment. So I think it will depend. I think that the facilitation fund has been fantastic for that kind of startup. Absolutely brilliant. And then potentially when the, the group gets wings, you know, it can kind of go a little bit further. That's kind of my insight. Um, there was just a couple of questions on kind of like results on the ground. And, I'm, and this is something I feel really, really strongly about because I get lots of people come to me and they're like, We've got a group, but nothing's really happening, and we want to actually get more stuff going. You know, what what do you what do you suggest? And the, one of the things that I do think is important is your farmers don't all have to agree. They don't all have to have the same farming system or the same opinion. Sometimes that actually makes for quite a fiery debate. Brilliant. I still have some in my farm group some that plough every single year and some that don't touch a plough. And that actually kind of creates discussion. The other thing is it's the skill of the person that is running the group to be able to prove to each landowner why a change should happen. So if I give you an example, we need to reduce our nitrate leaching. Massive problem, massive problem in the River Wensum. By buying our own water testing equipment, I'm able to test out of the land drains to get a factual figure to take back to the landowners. That's something no one else is offering, but we're able to discuss with the farmer in that system, right, let's cover crop next year. I think that's everything. Oh no, there's one more thing, competition. Competition, competition, competition. You get the facilitator to use tools like competition to drive on the ground change. And again, it comes back to the skill of that person. How do those farmers tick? How can I encourage them to actually get competitive with each other? Oh, Lizzie, I, can't, I feel like I need you to come and motivate me in my just general life. Um, Ian, do you want to come in? Yeah, just, just very quickly on, on that sort of competition side. Um, a, a lot of the skills of the facilitator, um, if, if a facilitator comes from a very, let's call it an environmental ecological background, They've often got really good skills in, in those areas, you know, real expert skills. But actually some of the things in terms of motivating business minded groups of, of you know, we, they are farmers, but they're business people actually requires sales skills mm. you know, and act, active, I call it active listening. So listening for what 
what their red buttons are for, for, for red lines and problems, but also listening to their green buttons, which are the go buttons, find out what they're interested in. And sometimes it's really bizarre. You, you don't expect them that someone's got a particular interest in you know, barn owls or something, but it's, it's, just that, it's just that little hook that you can find to, to, get, them, to get them interested and get them engaged with the thing. Um, and, and going back to Ellen's question about the different types of funding, I, I completely agree with Lizzie. There, there'll be a range. There'll be some projects that don't sit very well in the private finance arena, um, but others really will, particularly, you know, water and, uh, and carbon, perhaps. But, um, you know, some of these things are developing. And, and, and again, I, I agree with what Mike said earlier about there's so much noise in this space at the moment. Um, you know, we, we've just got to cut through that. And, a, and an effective facilitator will, will definitely help to do that. And thanks, Ian, because you've kind of taken me on to my next question, which is really helpful about um, how to get farmers more bought into it. So we've basically discussed why the, the facilitation is helpful for collaboration, some of the barriers that you faced, um, what different future funding models could look like and, and how the facilitation should work. So we want to build more of these groups. We want to get more collaboration going. Um, what's the realities of doing that? So AJ, you're, you're taking yours privately. What's the realities of trying to set it up on your own? Um, when are you, you're not having this funding and doing this paperwork? I think there's a question in there that I'm going to throw back at Ellen about kind of the entity that it needs to be, um, which I'm going to give you in a minute, Ellen, so you've got some prepare time. Um, right, OK, if I was to go back five years and start again, um, it would be to start small. If you decide that you're passionate about biodiversity and, and the natural world, and you understand the benefits of collaboration and therefore you want to get together with your neighbours, bring your neighbour, go for a pint, then get another one, and then maybe go for a pint and something to eat. Um, make it social initially. Don't worry about the structure. Um, there needs to be a small element of, of funding, just admin funding. Um, so I think, um, I think it was Lucy's point about subscription. Um, we had a subscription at the beginning. We decided not to make it an annual subscription simply because, as, as Ian pointed out, under Natural England's facilitation, um, actually all we could deliver was training. Um, so uh, I didn't feel justified in continuing with a big subscription, but I do think there needs to be some buy-in. So you know, it might be a small sum of money just to pay for beers and what have you. That's how I would start um, and just make it social events to talk about various things to do with the area that you live in and, and the, the types of habitats and species and issues, water, soil erosion, wind erosion, whatever it may be. Um, and then take it to a next level of, of, I don't know, ringing the local flag advisor and saying, we'd like to do a walk. We'd like to talk about this. We'd like to talk about that. So grow slowly very slowly um, Slow and make it fun it's got to be fun you're making it sound excellent aj um <laughs> so just on the kind of the, the slow grow one of the things i said at the beginning was um a future role of facilitators and some of you are probably doing it right now is is bringing in that private finance so you've talked about bringing private finance to fund the facilitation fund itself but actually is there a role for facilitators to help um, those groups access natural capital to fund their projects and kind of what do you envisage that role looking like I can see Mike nodding so I'm going to come to Mike and then I'll come to Lizzie's nodding head as well um, who needs a hand raise I, I think there I think there really is and I think there's, there's there's going to be growing opportunities in this space and I think a facilitator's got a kind of dual role they've got that role of kind of um, identifying what the opportunities are within their their groups and working with their landowners to see what sort of things they're interested in. And I think there's also that ability to turn and, you know, go and talk to, to um, investors and to try and start to get those conversations going and thinking about the scale that in, an investor might want to operate on it. You know, it may be that they're not looking to invest, you know, on a small scale on one farm for a bit of, I don't know, for woodland or something, but actually across multiple land holdings, there might be more of an opportunity. So that kind of bringing together the grouping together of ideas and opportunities, I think it can be a really key role for a, for a facilitator. Yeah, and Lizzie, you were nodding away. 
Yeah, going back to um, sort of like AJ's point as well, just quickly, um, I think this is the perfect time for any group to collaborate at the moment. We are experiencing such a big shift in the whole of our policy. Now is the time to exchange ideas. Now is the time to be better farmers and look for those funding opportunities where we need them. So coming back to the private sector, um, one of the things I feel very strongly about here is that everybody wants a slice of the cake. Have you noticed that all these people want farmers to sign up with agencies or sign up with organisations so that they get data on what habitats that those farmers have got or what different types of ponds or woods or whatever. So a facilitator like me, for example, has absolute intricate knowledge of every single farm I've got in my group, all 27 farms. Therefore, when I have in the past had somebody contact me and say, have you got a semi-improved grassland situated within this area? That farmer hasn't had to share his data or put anything on the line. I'm able to then go, OK, then I will contact the farmer and kind of go from there. And I think in the future, that is going to be absolutely essential to joining up those dots, but without a farmer having to put himself on the line and sign up with 15 different um, organisations and sharing their data. Yeah, and I think it's, wasn't they say data is the most valuable commodity we now own? Um, it's, it's a really big minefield. I just want to come back on um, Mike's point about scale and see if Ellen wants to say anything about, because there's a question in, in the chat about what's the right scale for facilitation groups. So some of you have got different size groups and, and different scale. What's the right scale for a facilitation group? I don't know. Ellen, if you want to come back on that and then we'll go to AJ. Uh, no, I'm, I'm really interested in the question, actually. I think um, <laughs> I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that you will tell me. I mean, I suspect the answer is there isn't a one size fits all. But I think it's interesting to know, is there kind of so I think the, the facilitation funds groups range from quite small sort of, you know, a handful of land managers through to I think the biggest one has about 80. Um, I'd be interested to know whether whether the panel has views on sort of the effective size, whether you can get too big that actually you outgrow the pub visits that, that AJ talks about so compellingly. I'm going to come to AJ, he's got his hand up, he was keen on that question. I will lower my hand and oh, <laughs> unmute myself, I've got it all right, wow. Well done. Um, yeah, it, it, there isn't one size that will, will suit every different farming type and landscape. I have this debate quite often with people, should we base groups around catchments, around counties, around districts, around um, natural character area maps. Um, and, and I think it will vary in different parts of the country. Uh, in our situation on the sandlands of East Suffolk, it, it, there's an obvious um, size, which is our natural character area of the Suffolk coasts and heaths. Um, we haven't got we haven't got everybody within the within that natural character area signed up uh, to be part of the group, but they're all farming similar soils. They've all got similar crops. Um, they tend to know each other. I think that's really important. I think once you get to a size where someone at the north end of a group has no connection whatsoever with someone at the bottom of you know the south end of the group it's much more difficult to get that sort of buy-in and knowledge exchange between individuals. Um, and yes, that will vary. So in parts of the country where there's lots of small farms, potentially those groups will be much smaller. Um, you get onto some of the big moorland farms and they could be massive. Mm. In our situation, it will be, I think, will be based around the natural character areas. Um, but yes, um, certainly some of the sort of, you know, where, where rivers are really important, it will be based more around catchment. Um, but it's, there is, I, I think it is, there is a danger of them becoming too big quite easily. Really interesting point there, AJ, about um, it's really easy to look at this and just get a map out and try and roll out by counties, but actually looking at what the land is in reality and, and the type of farming in it. Mike, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come back to that as well? Yeah, I was just going to come back on the on the scale one, and I, I think I agree. I think they can get they can get too big potentially, and you can start to drift into you know farms being very different but within the same group. And I think it can start to break down a little bit there if if there aren't common common themes. You know, some 
in Norfolk, for example, some things will probably be quite common across a lot of land holdings. If you want to target some work at ponds, for example, probably everyone's got ponds, so you can you can work with people on ponds or hedgerows. And but if you want to start making bigger changes, so for example, the group I've got that are looking at biodiversity net gain, they're talking like quite whole scale changes to their holdings and their businesses, which isn't going to be for everyone. So that's broken down into a much smaller group that are really looking to work on that in some detail. So maybe the something around the, some of the scale of the changes that people are making dictates some of the sizes of, of groupings. Mm -hmm. But I, I think always those groups, you know, there's, there's probably going to be some kind of catalyst that starts to bring a group together, some kind of some kind of hook. I think Ian was talking about that early on. There needs to be some kind of hook to get people together and get them motivated and get them wanting to sort of push through some of those changes. It's all about, it's, it's interesting, it's all about the drivers and the shared ambition and that's kind of what defines the rest of it and that we're kind of looking at this flipped way. So I am going to come to questions in the chat. I've been trying to get through them as we go, but um, I have not been so successful. So I'm going to throw this one at Ellen, which I did warn you I was going to throw at you. Um, when it comes to the farmer led groups entity, is DEFRA leaning towards certain requirements to enable collaborative projects or payments? limited liability, community interest companies, unincorporated associations. I wonder what private investors in natural capital will require. I thought a very well written question and, and not an easy one. Yeah, I think a really challenging one. Um, so previously having had um, really helpful conversations with the, the Game of Wildlife Conservation Trust, I think I saw someone on the um, on the in the audience who um, is from their Jess. Um, so I think they've got a really interesting model um, and um, I think it's not a it's not a resolved question. So we're looking at stuff through our tests and trials programs in terms of what the the structure can be. But you know, sort of back to what was said earlier, I don't think it's a one size fits all. Um, and if I can kind of link that with someone um, asking about group agreements, so um, really interested in the panel's view on this. But generally, what we've understood is that it's quite um, niche, I suppose, um, where. Land managers, land managers want to actually be legally bound to each other and in terms of the environmental outcomes that are delivered. So I guess certainly how it's worked as far as I understand it at the moment is sort of facilitators as, as coordinating individual agreements as opposed to um, uh, kind of overseeing uh, legally binding contractual agreements um, at, a, at, a, at a group scale. Um, but uh, again, I'm going to throw that one, one back at the, at the panel because I think it's it's really interesting to understand what other models are out there and what we see as the right way forward. Um, excluding things like commons, of course, where you know that kind of group agreement is, is a very different scenario. Um, but yeah. Well, Ian had his hand straight up, um, so I suspect he's got a very wise answer for us. <laughs> oh, I don't know about wise, but um, I just think we need to be careful to the audience that we don't necessarily make it too scary that these kinds of issues are not that common at the moment. I think they might become more, more, more frequent, but you know, we've got, we've got groups which are half a dozen people with, you know, they, they certainly don't need any contractual arrangements between them or anything. It, 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 it ranges right up. And, and even some of the bigger ones, the, the, the privately funded one, uh, I saw someone in the, in the chat asking about what these people are actually, what results they want. And, and some of them, it's, it's knowledge exchange. So for example, water companies, a good enough result for them would be actually farmers thinking more about what they're doing in terms of nitrates and phosphates. So it's just, and that having that, having that opportunity to have an interaction and a conversation, because, you know, having knowledge is, is the first point in, in, behavior change and so on. So they don't necessarily need um, very clear, measurable results all of the time. It, it, there can be some intangible results too. But then we've equally got, you know, a group of three farmers who are potentially doing a multi-million pound deal for biodiversity net gain. So there's every every version in that, but, though, but that multi-million pound deal is extremely unusual and more common would be a much lower base of you know, complexity in terms of the business structure of the group. And I mean, I know what Tom's talking about in his question, and he's, and he's really right. If you are trying to do something um, which is engaging with developers that are paying for specific outcomes, then you absolutely need to have a legal entity that is 
robust and protects everybody involved. Mm. But but that's quite that's quite the, the apex of the pinnacle of this of what's going on at the moment. And most people are much further away from that than and I, I wouldn't want to put people off getting involved because they think that's normal because at the moment it, it, it really isn't. Mm. AJ, I saw your hand and then Mike, is your hand st still up from before or is it that's a legacy hand? Classic. AJ, did you want to come in? Um, yeah, just on the on on the legal entity bit, I mean we we did the barest minimum we could get away with in terms of the Natural England Facilitation Fund. So it was a two sides of A4, um, basically saying we're all going to try and work together. And if we don't, we'll employ someone to resolve any disputes. <laughs> it was as simple as that. I think, and we're, again, we're now at the stage of looking at what sort of legal entity we, we want to be. Um, I think a lot of it will be driven by the private sector. So as Ian points out, you know, if you're dealing with a with a with a big business that wants specific outcomes and they're going to be delivered by specific farms, that then you do get into the realms of saying, well, you know, we're going to have to have some sort of formal agreement here. Mm -hmm. But until that point, I think uh, it's best to keep it um, as as low key as possible. Um, in terms of public funding, I would hope the government would look at um, a, 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 a cluster group or a facilitation group and go, yeah, what they're proposing looks good. Um, we can still have individual agreements with individual landowners uh, or we can have it with the group. And as long as they deliver, then they'll get the money, so to speak. Um, and that brings in a, another subject which I know we're not talking about today which is which is the role of a you know potential convener oh yes we're talking about advisors facilitators conveners there's there's a lot of different things but AJ you've just brought one and I'm conscious as you've put your hand up but I just want to get through as many questions as possible there's another question here about um from the private sector's point of view there needs to be a real concrete way to measure outcomes so AJ you were talking about it there like actually they want to show that you're delivering and I know Lizzie you've talked about it as well how does the panel see that that being measured, that measurement structure? How do you show those outcomes to a private company? Wow. Um, <laughs> well, AJ. I think, I think once you decide what the outcome is, is to be, you know, whether it is as, as measurable as creating 50 new dew ponds on the Marlborough Downs or whatever, um, or whether it's much more sort of ethereal, um, will dictate how it's measured. Um, it, it might be getting in ecologists involved. I, I you know, I really don't know the answer to that. But it will be it will be driven by what the part the private money wants, yeah. Um, uh, and how they, in combination with the group, want to measure it. Don't worry, AJ, about it being really challenging. I think it's a it's an outcomes based measurements is also something we're grappling with in DEFRA. Lizzie, your hand shot straight up, and I thought it might. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so measuring outcomes, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, is something that I think um, we actually need a bit of assistance with this. And um, so we work with Julie Hall, a well known social scientist, and I think there needs to be more support in government towards understanding how we can measure some of those outcomes that are a little bit kind of fluffy. Um, but with this kind of factual stuff, if I give you an example, I think we need to be better at working out how to measure. So, for example, if, if a water company turned around and said, right, they're going to pay us a bunch of farmers to reduce nitrates, but they were testing at the main river. Well, how would they know if we were ever making any difference? Right. Because they're just testing the main river, which has got a hundred different other um, you know, sources of pollution. If we get better at doing actual sampling of the data, i.e. with our water testing kit, where we're testing out of land drains in a very controlled manner, you can see the direct correlation between a cover crop, for example, and the outcome that that has. So I think we need to be better at measuring, but I also think there needs to be quite a lot of competition involved. So, and I've had conversations with, with Ellen about payment methodologies where you almost have a base payment and then a competition driven bonus payment. Those also need to be measurables, you know, the people that are aiming higher and then get rewarded for those higher deliverables. Oh, competition based payments. Very controversial. Um, I'm afraid we are running out of time and I'm really sorry I didn't get through more questions. Is there anything else the panel kind of wants to say if they might have seen the questions or a point they really want to make before we, we wrap up? 
I'm sure you're all going to get grilled after this with lots of emails. Ian, what would you like to come back with? Just, just very quickly on the thing about competition. One of the things that was really interesting, actually, in I, I did a meeting with Lizzie's group, and one of the one of the ways that, for example, cover crops have been funded is through what is basically termed a reverse auction, mm. and and actually that's been discussed as a way of funding, but. It, it came out really clearly from the farmers that they they actually wanted fairness. They didn't they didn't want that. They said they didn't want one person being paid more than another. But I think they what they really wanted was they didn't want to be paid less than somebody else. But you know, it doesn't doesn't matter why. But actually, fairness was really important to them. So you know, I, I think this competition thing. I I agree with Lizzie. It can be used brilliantly. It can be really effective. And just actually having the person that you normally want to impress the most is your neighbour. So, you know, if, you, if you're trying to sort of show, show off what you're doing, that's, that's really important, that's that competitive edge. But there is also this, this fairness and the facilitator is quite, quite an important role in, in that fairness in terms of the access to opportunities and the access for information. Now, just because someone takes a week to read an email, you know, because that's got the, and there's a deadline, you know, you can't, you can't make people react in time, but the, the fairness element is really, really important. Interesting balance to get right there. AJ, what did you want to come in with? Uh, just picking up on what Ian said about reverse auctions. It, reverse auctions do worry me because if you're if you're if you're putting out to tender, let's say for the sake of argument, turtle doves, um, the person who can deliver turtle dove habitat at, at the least amount of, for the least amount of money. Uh, is probably the person who's going to not necessarily deliver it the best. Um, you're playing into the hands of the big players um, with the lower costs, um, and it, it really does concern me, and everybody I've spoken to, it concerns them. One of the suggestions that our group put forward in terms of um, uh, how things could be funded uh, by the public sector is actually for... Um, and this isn't going against what Ian was just saying, but actually not looking at it necessarily on the fair basis, but actually saying, okay, within East Suffolk, these are the target habitats, these are the target species, etc. In the Fens, it's different. On the Marlborough Downs, it's different. On Dartmoor, it's different. Let the government decide what they want to see delivered in each particular area. Put a price on those deliverables and, a, and an amount they want delivered. If after two years of a scheme, not enough is being delivered, then they know they're not paying enough. If too much is being delivered, start paying less. It becomes market driven then. Yeah. Rather than, than taking it down to the lowest common denominator, which is what um, reverse auctions will do. I feel, AJ, you might have just taken the words right out of Mike's mouth because he's just put his hand back down <laughs> and I was going to give him the last word. But I think an interesting point there about, um, and the, one of the, the key elements of, of ELM is we often say it's trying to create that in, that environmental market where maybe there hasn't been one before. So there's a market for producing food, but actually where's the market for producing the environmental goods and how do we build that market? Now, Ellen, I don't know if that's a legacy hand or you want the last word hand. <laughs> really, really quickly. Um, yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, just come back on um, someone was asking about uh, more about group structure and the questions. I just wanted to clarify because I do think this sometimes comes out as a, as, a, as a bit of confusion that for local nature recovery or sustainable farming incentive, we're not requiring people to enter into groups. Collaboration isn't mandatory. So just to just to make that really, really clear. So we think collaboration is a really positive thing that we want to see more of. But that doesn't mean that um, entry into schemes is going to be mandatory based on whether or not you're in a collaborative group. Um, so just wanted to clarify that, but um, thanks, Catherine. Good fact to end on. Not mandatory, but just important. Um, I'm just going to hand back to Tim, who I think is going to talk about the next sessions, but just a huge thank you to the panel. I've got notes on here and I've got about 3,000 more questions I could have asked you. I think we could have had another at least two hours to go into some of the details of this, but really interesting and some really different experiences and backgrounds from all of you. So thank you so much for your contributions. I found it really interesting and I reckon, Ellen, you've got some work to do when you get back into the office. Just a little bit. No, thank you so much, everyone. That was really, really excellent to hear all your views. And thanks yeah. very much for, for your questions as well.